So what is social structure? You'll hear sociologists speak again and again about social structure or the word social structure. And um, sometimes they mean very different things when they say the word social structure. And today I'm going to give a series of examples of what social structure is and think about the different ways in which we all conceptualize, we scholars conceptualize social structure. Social structure, as a definition, I'll say, consists of the boundaries people confront as they make decisions about their individual and collective actions. I'll repeat that. Social structure consists of the boundaries people confront as they make decisions about their individual and collective actions. The idea here is that we can't just act any way that we want to, that there are sort of walls that prohibit certain kinds of things, but there are also tracks that guide us in particular sets of directions. Structure, in this sense, limits the choices people can make, but it also enables them to have choices that others may not have. So one conceptualization of the world is that each person has these wants and desires, and what we should do is facilitate a world where they can enact any of those things, and that any world that doesn't allow them to enact any of those things is somehow a world that impinges upon their freedom. This would be what um, uh, we might refer to as a very extreme version of liberalism. Liberalism as a political philosophy that says that the inhibition on people being able to act um, is a problem. And so therefore, one of the things that we should try to do is to our best extent possible, limit social structures or, or try and like inhibit social structures. This view, this classical liberal view is somewhat incompatible with a sociological perspective because from a sociological perspective, it's impossible to imagine a world without social structure. It's deeply naive to think that there could be a world without social structure. But more importantly, it's not that social structures limit us all the time, that they just simply narrow what is possible for us. In defining the possible, social structures often make life meaningful and may even make action possible. So what do I mean by this? Well, you know, it's true that structures can limit choice. But you all probably have experienced before this kind of paradox of choice, which is that if you have limitless choice, everything is available to you, it actually doesn't feel like you have a choice at all. It can feel paralyzing or totally overwhelming. Knowing what is desirable, having a sense of your own desires in relationship to others, may in fact be far more freeing. When we talk about structural boundaries, we're referring to the rules and resources that guide our behavior. And rules and resources are not just limits. They can enable us by making clear those sets of things that maybe we should do or maybe that we want to do. Put differently, um, uh, you can think about structural limitations as limitations, or you can think about structural uh, factors as enablers. And both, I'm going to opine, are the case. That is, structures can limit your choices, but structures can also enable you to do something. Now, this is an abstract discussion. Let me be a little bit more practical. Let me try and give you you know, like a lived experience example of this. So, um, uh, I'm uh, recording these lectures in a moment of COVID. And so uh, actually um, I, I live in New York City and there's not a huge capacity to go out right now. Um, but in the time before COVID or um, uh, in other time periods uh, uh, where you know, we, we weren't as constrained in terms of what it is that we could do, um, many of us may have had experiences where we... Um, have the opportunity to like go out and do something. So let's remember the last time you had a, a free weekend evening and you could like go out with friends or do all kinds of things. 
Think about two different times where that happens. The first is where you have absolutely no plans and you've arranged nothing with anybody. And then the other is where your friends say, do you want to go to this movie with us? In the former condition, when you have no structural constraints upon you, that is, you can walk out your door and do anything you want, it doesn't always feel terribly freeing or enabling. In fact, it can feel really horrible to be like, home alone with nothing to do. It is not the condition of perfect freedom. In some ways, it's a condition of like sadness for some of us. Like, wow, I have nothing to do, nobody to call. Like I could do anything I want, but like I'd actually rather have a plan. I'd rather have like something where someone had asked me to do something or some set of things that limited my choice, but enabled me to act in a particular way. So by contrast, if your friends were like, we're going to this movie, do you want to join us? That is a constraint, right? Like you don't get to choose what movie you go to. You have to be there at a particular time. You sort of fit within their overall schedule, but it can deeply enable you, can actually enable you in a form of expression. Another way of thinking about this is like friendships are fundamentally constraints upon you. If you and I are friends and you text me and I never text you back, hopefully at some point in time, you're going to stop contacting me because you're going to be like, that guy, Seamus, he's a jerk and I don't really want to talk to him anymore because he like doesn't actually respond to the obligations of friendship. He doesn't do the sets of things that friends are supposed to do, which is to respond to you when you send them a note. When I say that friends are obligations, they are in effect constraints on your freedom from one perspective. They don't allow you to do whatever you want. Instead, they are a structure that limits some of your actions. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do within that structure, you will find yourself without friends. In this way, you could think of friends as people who imprison you within a structure of obligation. And in some ways, that's exactly what they do friends kind of imprison you in a structure of obligation. But the fact that they do that doesn't actually limit your self-expression. It might enable it. In this sense, friends as a relational structure have the capacity to either enable or constrain you, but they do so through the structural constraints that they put upon you in your relational obligations, in the fact that you have to return that phone call. And the fact that you have to say to your friend, happy birthday, it's nice to see you. Can we see each other soon? And if you refuse to do that, if you refuse to meet that obligation of friendship, you in some ways terminate the friendship. But the obligation, the structural obligation of friendship is deeply enabling. We become who we are through our friends and through those associations with those people. And so I want you to think about structures not just as these oppressive things that limit us and make it impossible for us to sort of do what we really want to do, but at times as enabling structures that allow us to clarify what our wants and desires are and make our actions more socially meaningful. In this sense, we think about social structure as both those limits on the choices that we can make, but also enabling of a range of choices. And here, I would return us to Durkheim, the great theorist, as I said again and again, of moderation, who thinks about how it is that your integration into a group and your regulation to that, by that group could be excessive, there could be too much integration and too much regulation, or too absent, so not enough regulation and not enough integration, or kind of just the right amount. That is, just the right amount where you feel connected but not trapped to other kinds of people and where you feel like there's clarity on what you should do, but the, it's just clarity. It's not actually something where um, uh, you are absolutely um, um, uh, 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 required to act in a particular way. So when we talk about structural boundaries, what we're referring to is the rules and resources that govern our behavior. And so what do I mean by that? What are rules and resources? Well, rules are the formal and informal 
expectations for behaving in any given situation. You can think about this as norms as well. So norms are the formal and informal expectations for behavior in any given situation. So the different situations that we're in have different normative expectations, different sets of things that we should or shouldn't do. If I'm sitting at the dinner table with you, there are a lot of normative expectations about things I should, not, should and should not do. If while sitting at the dinner table with you, I took out nail clippers and started to cut my nails, this would be a pretty big violation of norms of how it is that I should act at dinner because it would be seen as being kind of rude um, and a violation of the expectations. That's not a formal rule. It's an informal rule. So nobody's, you know, there's no like law that says I can't do that. In this sense, rules or expectations or norms can either be codified in law or they can be informal and a set of practices that we all kind of agree upon. So as a student, there are rules, there are norms that are codified concretely within each school. If, for example, you plagiarize, that is, if, it, if you draw upon somebody's work and don't reference it and use it as if it were your own words, you would be breaking a formal rule because there are formal rules against that practice. There are other informal rules that you could also break, things that aren't just like, that aren't written down, but are truly expected. So if we were in a classroom together and one of you stood up and started giving an alternate lecture while I was speaking, this would be breaking an informal rule. There's no rule that says only the professor can deliver a lecture. But if you were to suddenly try and deliver your own lecture as a student in the classroom, this would be breaking an informal rule because it violates the expectation of your behavior in a situation. Different situations have different norms. So in a classroom, the fact that I talk all the time is actually consistent with a normative expectation. But if we were friends and we were out for a walk together, or even acquaintances and out for a walk together, and I had spoken as much as I've spoken recently, which is to say 100% of the time and you never said anything, it would be a violation of a norm of conversation. Nobody should speak as much as I'm speaking right now in a situation that isn't a classroom. It would be incredibly rude. And so rules or norms are the formal or informal expectations of behaving within any one gets situation. And they're part of a social structure. So social structures are the formal and informal rules for different kinds of situations. Resources are things that we have or acquire, such as money, education, or status. Um, they could also be things that we use. So things that we acquire, that we um, use, um, or even they could be positions that we hold, such as money, education, or um, uh, status. There are other kinds of structural resources beyond, of course, money, education, and status. So race is a resource. It's a kind of um, resource that people have or acquire. So is gender or religion or nationality, ability, or age. And here, we might think about the ways in which um, people have social statuses and social roles. So a status is a person or a group's socially determined position within a larger group or a society. So a status is a person or a group's socially determined positions within a larger group uh, or a society. So different people and different groups in a society have different status positions. This would be distinct from, in a Marxian sense, a class position. So whereas class is your position within a series of economic relations, and people will have different positions, status is going to be something different. And we'll think about status in two important ways. The first is ascribed, and the second is achieved. So ascribed status, um, A-S-C-R-I-B-E-D, ascribed, are things that are assigned to society at birth. So what is an ascribed status position? Um, one example of an ascribed status position would be 
your nationality. So you don't do anything initially to acquire your nationality. Like you literally don't do anything because you're not even involved in where it is that you're born. Instead, it's ascribed to you at birth. It's something that is given to you in the moment you are born. So nationality is a good example of this. Class is a, can be a position that's ascribed to you at birth. What does that mean? It means that the family that you, you, you grow up in has certain economic resources. You didn't do anything to acquire those resources. You were born into that position. Gender can be something that is ascribed to you at birth. You don't do anything to get your gender, at least for now. We're going to challenge that a little bit as we um, uh, uh, think through gender relations in a subsequent lecture. Race is ascribed to you at birth. Your racial identity and um, uh, your racial categorization is something that gets ascribed to you in the moment that you're born. And in this sense, there's a social structure that produces ideas of gender, ideas of class, ideas of race, ideas of nationality, which you yourself inherit the moment that you're born. So we are born into social structures and different societies have different social structures. So what it means to be born into the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is very different than what it means to be born into Norway in terms of the gender status that you're ascribed at birth. That is, if you were born in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia as a man, it means something very different than if you're born in Norway as a man, in part because the ascriptive characteristics of gender in Norway are deeply egalitarian, or in other words, the Norwegians believe deeply in gender equality. And so being, a man, being born a man in Norway is to be born into a gendered condition of not perfect equality, but pretty high degrees of gender equality. By contrast, being born a man into Saudi Arabia has a deeply different meaning. It is a meaning wherein your structural position is one of domination. Men have huge amounts of authority over women in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In this sense, the difference between being a man in these two places, in Norway versus in Saudi Arabia, is socially structured. That is, it's part of a social structure, not just simply the biology of manness. These are ascribed characteristics. There are also statuses that are achieved, like an achievement. Achieved st statuses are things that emerge in part because of people's unique talents, efforts, or characteristics. So you are born into a class position. You are ascribed a class position at birth. And that class position is the class position of your parents. But you can also achieve a class position. It's more or less possible in different societies. But the class position that you're ascribed to at birth is not necessarily and often not at all the class position that you end up with in the middle of your life. In other words, there are things that you can do on the basis of your talents, your efforts, or your characteristics to achieve a new status. So I could be born into a very wealthy family, but because of my efforts, characteristics, and um, activities, I could lose that economic position. So I could be a pathological liar who like, you know, breaks all of my social relationships all the time, who is not particularly talented or skilled, in which case I may achieve a lower status position a lower class position because of the ways in which I acted. You right now are listening to these lectures and you're listening to them in part for your general education, but you're also listening to them in part to achieve a, a class position.
Like, you know, we should be real about what education is. It's a way in which you achieve a status in society. So you are doing things right now to achieve a position. And there are lots of things that we do to achieve positions. And there are things that were ascribed at birth, like our intelligence, for example, that help us achieve that. Our lives are a constant interplay of ascription and achievement. And as we'll talk about later, part of the analysis of sociology is an analysis of this interplay of ascription and achievement, of the ways in which things that we do and things that are done to us produce and reproduce the social world. But I want you to think about what are the different social statuses that were ascribed to you at birth, that you had absolutely no control over, that there were social structures that helped to determine them for you. You know, and, you know, if you're born um, uh, of a particular race in the United States, it has a different meaning than if you're born of a particular race in Korea and if you're born of a particular race in Nigeria. The racial conceptualizations are social structures that help ascribe different meanings and resources to the different positions that you are ascribed at birth. You're also ascribed some set of talents, but you have to do things as well to cultivate those talents, to develop them. Being really smart doesn't get you much if you don't actually practice your intelligence and try to cultivate it and drive it in some direction. Being a really, really skilled athlete doesn't do much if you don't train. And so the things that you're ascribed at birth require some degree of achievement as well. In this sense, there's what we would call human capital, the sets of traits that you kind of both inherit at birth and that you then cultivate in order to have a series of skills. And your position in a society is a combination of ascription and achievement of the social structures that influence you and the things that you do within those structures to acquire a position. It's important to note that the impact of social structures doesn't end at birth. So it's not like you're ascribed a characteristic at birth and the impact of that structure ends and then you just begin achieving. The ascription of a gendered social position at birth has big impacts at midlife as well. So the fact that you are ascribed a particular gender um, um, identity at birth still has impacts for you much later in life. We know this when we look at, for example, women's wages and the ways in which women in the United States in particular, but in almost all countries, and I would opine to say all countries, make less money than men. This is this idea of the impact of social structure, even in light of achievement. Okay, what are roles? Roles um, are the set of expectations concerning behavior and attitudes of people who occupy a particular social status. So insofar as you are ascribed a gender identity at birth, a gender identity, in my case, of maleness, there are a set of expectations concerning the behavior and attitudes of people within that status. These are not totally fixed. There are different ways in which I can do or perform masculinity. But they have some degree of fixedness, which is to say there are some things that are clear expectations of maleness within my particular society. And there are different standards of masculinity and femininity across different societies. We'll greatly expand upon this in our series of lectures on gender. But for now, I just want you to think about the status position that you're ascribed at birth or that even you achieve through the course of your lifetime comes with a set of expectations of behavior, that roles have normative expectations of how it is that you should behave. This means that they can be problematic insofar as they limit interactions. There are certain things, you know, if you're going to conform to norms of masculinity, they're expected of you. Or certain things, if you're going to conform to expectations of femininity, that can limit you. 
but overall, statuses have behavioral expectations that are associated with them. Now, life chances, and this concept actually comes directly from Max Weber. Um, Max Weber thinks of class not as your position within the mode of production, which is Marx's definition, but instead as your life chances. So this is going to be Max Weber's definition of class, are roughly the opportunities to provide yourself material goods and um, favorable life experiences. Um, uh, Weber sort of thinks of class as your position within market relations and how that position in market relations influences your life chances. So in Weber's conceptualization of class, class is not your position within a, a, a system of production, the kind of work that you do. It's the amount of money that you have. And these are two different ideas of class that we'll return to in future lectures. Occupying a high status in society overall improves your life chances and provides more structural resources and um, brings greater societal rewards. And here, um, I'm showing... Uh, uh, the relationship between education and earnings, which is one of the primary things that American sociologists study, something we spend a lot of time studying. And here what you'll see is that if you have less than a high school degree, so fewer than 12 years of schooling, you will on average make 21000 a year, whereas if you receive a graduate degree, you'll make 67000 a year, three times as much. It's a huge transformation in your life chances. And so different status positions, that is the position of having a degree, have large impacts on people's overall life chances. You know, some of this is because there are rewards to skills. And if you develop and cultivate skills, your position on markets allows you to acquire more money. And there may be really good reasons for, to want to create incentives for people to develop more skills. But in different societies, the gap between people with graduate and professional degrees and people who've just completed high school is either bigger or smaller. And so social structural conditions influence the degree to which status has an impact on people's lives. Seeing social status as a structural resource has a long tradition in sociology. The concept of life chances, as I said, comes from Max Weber. American children with a high level of academic achievement who achieve a lot of education from affluent families are more likely to attend college. They're more likely to complete a bachelor's degree. They're more likely to attend a selective institution and then get a graduate or professional degree than are high achieving children from low income families. In other words, similar children from parents of different social backgrounds have different outcomes. This is why I'd said that class is both an achievement and an ascription. Because if you are a high achieving student from a low income family versus a high achieving student from a high income family, you will have different outcomes on average. The high achieving student from a low income family will do less well overall than the high achieving student from the high income family. And this is because of social structural conditions where the status of your family matters for your outcomes. And that is something that is ascribed to you. And this is what I mean by class being both an ascription and an achievement. High achieving children from low income families do better than, high achieve, than low achieving families from low income families. So it's not that the children's work never matters or doesn't matter. Of course it matters. And in different social structures, it has the greater capacity to matter or not. But affluent people can afford to continue their education after high school and to pass on those benefits to children through things like extracurricular activities, tutoring, travel, additional paid educational opportunities. People from lower social classes are often compelled to devote larger portions of their limited resources to necessities, such as housing, food, transportation, the children of those families are, more required, are often more required to work for paid employment in order to contribute to the family. And so high-income families can dedicate resources for their children to not work and to continue schooling. And this is how we see patterns of inequality emerge because of a combination of 
both ascribed and achieved dynamics, both the traits of people and their drive and their capacity, but also deeply influenced by the sets of conditions, structural conditions that they are born into and the overall logic of that society. So here, um, much of our social interaction takes place within groups and is influenced by group norms and by the rules or expectations by which a group guides behavior of its members. So groups provide um, uh, members with valuable resources, such as social support, a sense of collective identity, values, and opportunities for positive life chances. Groups are, you know, really simply defined as two or more people with similar values and expectations who interact with one another on a regular basis. So if you, you've ever used the phrase, you know, you guys may not use this phrase, but I have like of a friendship group. It is the set of people that might be my friends. And in general, we have similar values and expectations for how we interact. And different groups that you're a part of might have different values and different expectations for action. So your friends are one group and your family is another. And the ways in which you interact with your friends is different than the ways in which you interact with your family, typically. And the values that your family expects of you may be different than the values that your friends expect of you. Networks, something we will talk about more and more and more, are a series of social relationships that link a person directly to other individuals and indirectly to even more people. When I introduced you to the idea in Durkheim of organic and mechanical solidarity, what I was effectively introducing you to was the idea of a network structure, by which I mean that there's a structure of the patterns of connections that you have with others. There's a structure to the pattern of social relationships and that networks reflect this structural pattern. In mechanical societies, you have a dense network structure where each person that you're connected to is connected to other people as well. In an organic system, by contrast, it is a looser affiliation of a network structure. Think for a moment about different social groups that you've been in. Sometimes you have a network structure that's very dense. This would be like a friendship click. Other times you have a network structure that's a little bit more diffuse. We'll think a lot about how it is that networks provide critical opportunities for people. We know, for example, that people don't get jobs just by being qualified for them. They get jobs in part by having network affiliations or ties directly or indirectly with other people who are in jobs. We know this intuitively, right? One of the reasons you might want to go to a really, really high status school is that that high status school gives you access to people who get jobs in high status places. And that connection matters, that network tie matters. And so being of a particular position isn't just about the resources that come with yourself in that position, but instead the web of affiliations that you have and you can, how you can draw upon that for a set of resources. Finally, institutions um, are the uh, central domains of social life that guide our behaviors and meet our social needs. All institutions provide individuals with important resources with, while simultaneously imposing some set of rules or conduct. And here, sometimes we use the phrase institutions and organizations interchangeably. Um, sometimes we make a distinction between them. I'm going to give a long lecture on organizations in a little bit, and so you can look towards that lecture for a distinction between us. So now we have a sense of social structure, the ways in which the set of conditions around us structure our lives. And the idea behind this is not just that they limit us, but they're going to enable us. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk for a moment about the individual and in particular, pay attention to individual agency. So how it is that we act within the sets of structural conditions that typically, at least at birth, we inherit or are born into, and how those actions might have the possibility of transforming social structural conditions.